In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now turn to chapter 20 in the book of 2 Kings. This is our journey through the book of 2 Kings. If you like to study scripture and you want to walk through each chapter in the Bible, this is the YouTube channel for you. That's what we do in this channel. So in this chapter, in chapter 20, we have one of the great miracles that occurs in the Old Testament, and it really complements the miracle that happens in chapter 19. In both cases, the Lord is listening to the prayer of a righteous King Hezekiah. It shows us how quickly God answers the prayer of a righteous person. And so let's talk about this. Hezekiah was ill, he was going to die, and he's going to turn to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord is going to not only heal him, but he's going to be healed on the third day. Okay, so we're going to talk about the significance of, of this miracle on the third day in Jerusalem. So let's go to chapter 20 and let's see what happens with this great miracle. Now remember, you want to go back and look at chapter 19. And you want to look at how the Lord protected the city from the Assyrian army, the greatest army on the face of the earth. And then right after protecting the city from the greatest army on the face of the earth, Hezekiah becomes sick. And this is very important because the life of faith is filled with many trials. You know, one moment God is answering a prayer and the next moment something difficult is occurring. And so it's really a reminder to us of how we must be faithful to the Lord, no matter what trials come upon us. So let's go to chapter 20 and see how Hezekiah deals with this trial. We can learn a lot from Hezekiah. It says, in those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. So it's really like a sickness to death that he has. And Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos, came to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die, you shall not recover. Now what's amazing about this is this is the word of God. You're going to die according to the word of God. You're going to die. And this really, this whole scene reminds us of the scene in Genesis 22. And I'll talk about that as we go into the notes after we read through the text. But just keep that in mind. According to the word of God, you are going to die. And it's going to remind us of Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac, when God told Abraham, take your only son, Go up Mount Moriah and sacrifice that son. So let's talk about how, what happens in this case here with Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, this is probably occurring right around 700 BC, 700 years before Christ is born. He's a righteous king. Look at his reaction after this. He doesn't complain. He doesn't get angry. Instead, it says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord. He just turned to God immediately in prayer. He didn't get angry at Isaiah, he didn't get angry at anyone. He just turned to the wall and prayed. It's like he just needed time alone with the Lord. He couldn't move, so he had to just turn to the wall and pray. And I love this reaction here, because how many times have we overreacted? How many times have we said the wrong thing? How many times have we just said what we felt like saying? and afterwards regretted it. Hezekiah simply turns to the wall and he prays. And notice how he prays. He says, remember now, O Lord. The concept of remembering in the Hebrew Bible, it's a very profound concept. The word, the verb is zachar. Uh, and we find this concept, if you wanna look up a few verses, you can go to Genesis chapter eight, verse one, when God remembered Noah. And that act of remembering Noah started the process that would allow Noah to go into the new creation. You can also look at Psalm 132, where the psalmist petitions the Lord to remember the afflictions of David. And so in a similar way, the, the word remember, it's often, it's, it's often connected with the Lord not thinking about something cognitively, but actually remembering or acting upon a covenant promise. 
And so there's something beautiful here about remembering and God acting on behalf of a faithful servant. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I walked before thee. In, and look at how he walked before the Lord. So walking before the Lord, what this has to, to do with is continual conduct, okay? It's not just, you know, this is, you know, you know, I was just walking before the Lord. No, no, no. It's referring to a lifestyle, continual conduct. That's what it means. How I have walked before thee in faithfulness, okay? And the word for faithfulness is emmet. The word can actually mean truth. And so some translations might read truth. It's a little bit more literal. In faithfulness or truth and with a whole heart. The word for whole heart can be translated a complete heart. So you see a man who is faithful, truthful, and sincere. And and have done what is good in thy sight. So to do good what in thy, what is in thy sight, it's... It's a concept of living in the presence of the Lord, doing what is right in God's presence. You might go to the book of Jonah, and if you read the book of Jonah, you see the, the contrast to this. Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, okay? Here's Hezekiah doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And then when you when you read the book of Second, Second Kings, 16 times it says that a king did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So Hezekiah is different than many of the kings in 2 Kings. So, and it goes on and it says, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. And what's beautiful about this is God is not only going to hear the prayer, but he's also going to note Hezekiah's weeping. He knows his tears. And there is really something beautiful here if you study the chapter closely, because when Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11, you can really see this. God even knows the tears. I mean, he understands more than we can imagine every tear that we shed. So Hezekiah weeps bitterly and watch what God says. So here's my favorite part. Verse four. And, and I'm going to highlight it here. you got to look at verse 4 and just kind of read this a few times. Because it says that right as Hezekiah is praying, Isaiah is leaving the city. And so Isaiah is leaving. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court of the city, middle court, it's probably most likely the middle court of the king's palace. So Isaiah is walking away. Hezekiah is praying. And before Isaiah has even gone out of the middle court, which is probably the king's palace or the middle of the city of Jerusalem, the lower part of the city, the higher part was where the temple was, the lower part would have been where the king's palace was. Before he even gets out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. God answered his prayer quick. It's a beautiful example of how God can answer the prayer of a righteous person. And you know, when you when you look at this, this scripture reading here, this should motivate each one of us to be righteous in God's presence. Don't make any exception to commit a sin. Don't make any excuse to commit a sin. Seek to be holy in God's presence. So look at what the, the word of the Lord says. It comes, to, it comes to Isaiah, and immediately he is told, turn back and say to Hezekiah, the prince of my people, go back and talk to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. Now, Hezekiah's father was a very unfaithful king, Ahaz. But here it says, David, your father. So David was his father, you could say, a few hundred years before that. All right, almost 300 years before that. But it's underlining that you're a descendant of David, the one to whom the Lord has promised he will always have an heir upon his throne. So thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. That didn't take long. I have seen your tears. Now notice this, the Lord, he even takes note of Hezekiah's tears. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. 
On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Now notice it. This is what's amazing is that not only is he going to be healed, okay? But where is he going to go when he is healed? He's going to be healed. And on the third day when he's healed, he will go to the house of the Lord. This is very important. He's going to go up to the top, the upper part of Jerusalem, the place where the temple is, to the house of the Lord on the third day. And this is really amazing if you look at this because it reminds us of Genesis 22. Because God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, and he received him back alive on the third day. Here, the word of the Lord is saying, you're going to die. And, be, and because of Hezekiah's righteousness and his prayer, the Lord says, well, guess what? You're going to live. And on the third day, you're going to go to the house of the Lord. Now, what is this all preparing us to understand? I will, I'll give you my opinion. I think it's preparing us to understand the resurrection of Jesus. And so you have this image a few times in scripture of being healed on the third day. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through the notes, but just keep that in mind. So look at what the Lord says. You, on the third day, you're going to go to the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. That's pretty good. I will deliver you and the city from the, from the hand of the king of Assyria. That's pretty good. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of, for my servant David's sake. Now, what is this whole thing about? I'm going to defend it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Well, it goes back to the great promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 10 to 16, it's often referred to as the dynastic promise, the promise of a dynasty, where the Lord promised to David, you will always have a descendant upon your throne. And so when the Lord says, for my sake, the promise that he made, and for my servant David's sake, in other words, the, prom the person he made the promise to, He's referring right back to that great promise. Now, this promise made to David, you will always have a descendant or a seed upon your throne. It will reach fulfillment in the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah. So Hezekiah would, would hear these words and think, you are going to fulfill your promise. And so Hezekiah would, would remain on the throne. He would have had other descendants and so forth, but ultimately the promise will be fulfilled in the fullest way in the coming of Christ the Messiah. So chapter 20, verse 7, Isaiah also said, bring a cake of figs and let them take and lay it on the boil that he may recover. This is very interesting. So some scholars say that this was common in the ancient world to you know you know to do this so he put these figs on it and, and you know you could say that it's something like an outward sign of the work that god is doing he's not being healed because of the figs but for some reason they're using this as an outward sign it's the lord himself who's going to heal hezekiah that's very plain in this text so let's not confuse that so in verse 8 it says that in hezekiah said said to isaiah what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, that I shall go to the house of the Lord on the third day? So he's asking, you know, what's going to be the sign? And so here's what Isaiah says. This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or go back 10 steps? And so look at the question here. Is a shadow going to go forward or go back? Hezekiah answered, is it, it is an easy thing for the, for the shadow to lengthen 10 steps, but rather let the shadow go back 10 steps. And Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow back 10 steps by which the sun had declined on the dial of Ahaz. So they actually had a, sun, a sundial there that was established by Ahaz, who was Hezekiah's father. And the shadow went back 10 steps. And what's really interesting is it was in, it was in Isaiah chapter 7 that Ahaz didn't want to ask for a sign. 
and he was given the promise of the virgin giving birth to a child. The young woman will give birth to a child or virgin will give birth to a child and you shall call him Emmanuel. God is with us. And so here's Hezekiah saying, what's the sign? He's not testing God. He's simply asking. And so he, the shadow goes back 10 steps. Now, you might remember something very similar in the book of Joshua where the sun stood still. It's in Joshua chapter 10. OK, and so what's really interesting is you go to verse 12 and it says at that time, Meordach Baladan, the son of Baladan, the king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and presents to Hezekiah. These are the Babylonians, okay? They are going to be bad guys. They're going to be enemies of Israel, but at this moment, they're not because the great empire is the empire of the Assyrians. The Babylonians are kind of rebelling against the Assyrians, so they seem to be possibly favorable people to become friends with, okay? So here's what happens. He heard that Hezekiah had been sick, and Hezekiah welcomed them and showed them all the treasure, all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, the armory, all that was found in his storehouses, for there was nothing in his house or all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. You know, he's showing them all his treasures, okay? And Isaiah, the prophet's going to come back and say, you know what, that was a bad idea. This people will remember this. And they will come back and they will destroy this city. Uh, and that's going to happen over 100 years later. So then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And whence did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that is in your, fa your fathers and all that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who are born to you shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, what's going on here? You know, in, in the New Testament, Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine. The Babylonians were going to conquer the Assyrian Empire. And about 100 years later, over 100 years later, they would come to Jerusalem. They would essentially conquer the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem would try to rebel against them on a couple occasions, and the Babylonians would absolutely decimate the city. They would destroy the temple. So in verse 19, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not if there will be peace and security in my days? So Hezekiah was kind of like, well, you know, that's not going to happen for a long time. How many times have we, we said that? The rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, this is really interesting because it mentions the book of Chronicles here, okay? And scholars debate about when the book of Chronicles was written, whether it was earlier or later. That's an ongoing debate with scholars. What's also interesting is it talks about how Hezekiah brought water into the city he built this amazing stream underground called the Gihon Spring. To this day, if you go visit Jerusalem, you can actually go and walk through this underground stream. It's called the Gihon Spring. So if you do take a trip to Jerusalem, make sure you go to the city of David and you, and you walk underground 500 meters through the Gihon Spring. So we finished this chapter, chapter 20, and you can see how God saved Hezekiah. But Hezekiah made one great mistake at the very end, showing the Babylonians all of his property. So just a couple things to review in this chapter. First and foremost, it underlines the importance of Hezekiah's prayer and how, as a righteous king, he didn't get upset. He simply turned to the Lord in his dire need. The, the next thing that's important is that Hezekiah is healed on the third day. 
And on the same day, he goes to the very temple of God to give thanks to the Lord. It was Jesus who would rise from the third day just outside of that temple centuries later. It was Abraham who took his son Isaac right up to that temple and received right up to that. I'm sorry, there was no temple there. He took him up to Mount Moriah, the place where the temple would be built, the same location. And he received him back alive on the third day. So why is Genesis 22 important? Because Hezekiah went to the temple to pray on the third day, the same location where Abraham received Isaac back alive on the third day. And then 730 years later, Jesus rises from the dead on the third day, just outside of the walls of the temple. Isn't that amazing? Location, 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 as they say. So always consider that when you're reading the biblical narrative. Uh, another thing that's important is Hezekiah's righteous life and how he turns to the Lord in prayer. And he simply says, Lord, look at how I've lived my life. Please hear my prayer. And, God, and he's humble. He humbles himself. He's not angry. And so don't let your anger get to you in a difficult situation. Come to the Lord in humility, no matter how difficult the situation is. Remember Hezekiah, and you will have great peace in your heart. You will have the peace of Christ, no matter how difficult the situation is. The concept of remembering, we find that in Genesis 8.1. You might want to go to Genesis 8.1 if you want to look more into that concept. Of course, this is one of the quickest responses to prayer that you've ever seen. Immediately, his prayer is answered, and Isaiah has to do a 360, or I, I'm sorry, a 180, and go back and say, well, guess what, Hezekiah? A little bit of a change is going to happen here. You're going to be healed on the third day, and you're going to go to the temple and pray. So the Lord promises he's going to add 15 years to Hezekiah's life. He's going to protect him by the Syri from the Assyrians. But I think the most important part is, He's healed on the third day, and he will go to the temple and pray on that day, okay? Um, so there's much more that could be said in chapter 20. But I think if you look at chapters 19 and 20, you really see how important prayer is. And so we find this in the life of Hezekiah. He was a righteous king who lived during a terrible time in Israel's history. No matter how bad things are around us, let us be faithful to the Lord and let us be people of sincere prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.